Yes. Okay. <laughs> I don't know. I can't hear anyone. Okay. All right. Let's keep going. All right. Cool. So now uh, we talked about the different um, survey methods and the hierarchy of data. Now we just want to get into a little bit of a, a stats review before we get into the guts of the analytical approaches of the occupancy models. So um, this is just a uh, general stats review of, uh, and study design review. Um, so study design, you know, the three most important questions, why, what, and how. Um, and so the why is the reason for collecting data. Again, remember I said, Sometimes we're interested in the ecology of, spe of a species and their interactions, maybe disease ecology, et cetera, um, or conservation. We want to test a management approach and evaluate it and see if it's working or not, and then adapt uh, beyond that. And so I can't stress enough that, uh, especially when you're when you're early on in graduate school or undergraduate research, et cetera, uh, I can't stress enough that it's important to uh, come up with a, a, a question um, and answer these three questions before you really get out there and start, you know, buying camera traps, for example, and setting them out and, um, and just trying to figure out what you want to do with the data later. Um, so this is, this is a good uh, exercise to go through uh, when you're first planning your graduate research. So the question is why, what? Um, so, so you have the why, then you need the what. You need to think about the type of data required to answer the why. Um, and then how the, uh, you really should be thinking about the data collection and the analysis plan. Um, to answer those whys and then have, again, clear objectives that relate to these components. And so um, I, I'm, I'll leave uh, the background story uh, out, but for example, I, I recently started a uh, consulting project where I'm analyzing some rodent data from track tubes. And uh, I, I got this whole data set of, of uh, of rodent track tube data, and they leave these track tubes out for a whole month. And you know, the rodents walk over the ink pad, they leave their footprints, and then you can tell if the, if the uh, mouse lives at that study, at that, at that track tube site or not. And they leave these out for a month at a time. They survey them every single month, 12 months a year for three years. And so, this is a case of uh, monitoring without necessarily having a uh, specific question. It's just, um, you know, keeping track of a species of concern. And so uh, one, of the, one of the problems is these, uh, uh, these rodents actually move quite a bit. Uh, the, the environment that they live in is fairly dynamic and these tubes are full of bait. And so what the researchers were actually finding is some of the rodents will actually live in the tubes because they keep getting refilled with bird seed. And so, uh, you know, I'm analyzing these data. <laughs> and to be honest, there's not really much you can answer about the ecology or the management of this species because you don't have the resolution of data because there wasn't a specific study question other than we want to monitor the population. Now, population monitoring is important for threatened and endangered species, uh, game species, regulated harvest species, but we need to think about the question and how to inform management before we start doing these long-term monitoring approaches that might be overkill. We might be collecting way more data than we need. Um, and, and obviously, uh, the important thing is to think about how can we optimize data collection to collect enough to answer the why and the what and the how for 
are studied. And so uh, having, having, you know, three years of monthly survey data for an endangered rodent might not necessarily be at, as helpful as having, you know, shorter spouts of, uh, you know, quarterly data even um, and to answer the same question. And so uh, those resources could be used for surveying other species, things like that. So remember, we have our different types of data again. We have our hierarchy that go into our, uh, you know, we think about these as we plan our study design. And we think about those when, we, when we're uh, working on our study objectives. So we have to think about what is the quantity to be estimated or uh, in, uh, replace quantity with the parameter to be estimated, right? We can look at abundance. If we're interested in um, harvest for something like uh, coyotes, um, you know, perhaps using an occupancy model might not be the most effective way to uh, estimate the impact of harvest. We, we need abundance data or survival data. And we could look at say, okay, um, we want to quantify the harvest of coyotes in Oklahoma, for example. Now, you could run an occupancy model and look at the distribution of coyotes across the whole state of Oklahoma, but I'm willing to bet that you would see that uh, at the occupancy level, your inference is just that coyotes occur everywhere in Oklahoma, right? And so you do need to get some more resolution than that if you're to inform coyote harvest. Now, I don't know, maybe they're harvesting so many coyotes that they are uh, extirpated from some areas. I'm, I'm not totally familiar, but, um, but that's an example where we need abundance information and perhaps we need survival of young of the year that are dispersing to see, to estimate mortality rates from things like harvest, trapping, hunting. Um, we have to think about what is the temporal and spatial scope of the study. So uh, how big the, how the size of the study area and the duration of the study. Now remember, uh, if, we keep, if we keep on theme with our coyote uh, question here, coyotes, uh, um, you know, they have relatively quick uh, gestation. Um, uh, you know, they, they can breed really fast, especially if resources are available. And so you want to think about how big of an area you need to survey in terms of where these individuals might be dispersing, uh, what the home range size of an individual is to think about how large of a study area to sample if you're trying to estimate abundance. If you put out uh, 10 cameras in a 10 hectare plot, you know, that's that's much smaller than even one coyote home range. So you're probably only going to detect one or a couple individuals. And so you need to scale that up if you're uh, going to be able to spatially sample enough to answer this question about harvest of coyotes. Um, and then the duration of the study, we want to think about closure, population closure, which is the population is not changing during our uh, period of inference. And so sometimes that could be as small as a couple months to maybe half a year, because you want to try to um, minimize the immigration, emigration, births and deaths affecting your inference. Um, what is the criteria for reliability? You want to make sure that uh, you, you think about the power of your study to make, uh, you know, um, strong inferences about your population. So you need to think about what is the uh, level of precision that we want to inform management, uh, what is the accuracy that we want to inform management, because uh, oftentimes um, we see that the, these, these, you know, especially a species like coyotes, are very adaptable. They occur in a variety of different habitats, and maybe you, you don't see much of the effect of, of any uh, habitat associations. And so the precision of your estimates can be uh, very wobbly where you say, okay, um, you know, there's somewhere between uh, 25 and uh, 108 coyotes 
per hundred square kilometers. Those are completely made up numbers, by the way. Um, and the problem is, is that a, a high enough resolution to inform management? Probably not. Um, I, I suspect in, coy in coyotes in Oklahoma are similar to North Carolina where there aren't a ton of regulations necessarily about uh, their hunting. But um, moving on. So uh, then we have to think about the practical constraints such as costs, uh, the manpower, human power, um, safety permits and protocols. Uh, again, if you're dealing with an endangered species, for example, uh, you're going to have a hard time getting permits to um, handle, tag, sample uh, the genetic data from these individuals. And it might be a lot easier to survey them with uh, non-invasive uh, techniques. Um, so again, pretty basic stuff here. Uh, thinking about census versus sampling. So a census is the count of all the animals in a population, right? Where the population, where a population is the total number of individuals interacting uh, in a particular location or region. Um, and uh, whereas sampling, so this would be, for example, in the Great Plains, you can do a helicopter flyover and count all of the elk in an area or all of the bison in an area because there's nowhere for the bison to hide because there's no trees, they're huge, and you can count effectively how many are in a given ranch because it's all fenced in for you. That is a census where, we, where we, we're not estimating, we are counting. We know basically with certainty that we know exactly how many individuals live in an area. Whereas sampling is a subset from a clearly defined uh, target population. And that is where we're going to count all the animals in our sampling units um, or areas. And then we're going to estimate how many there are within our target population. And so the workflow for these uh, studies is to sample data, uh, you know, and then there's a whole bunch of data management, data cleaning, um, and then uh, integrate it into our model. And so, you know, depending on the data, we're going to think about which model is most appropriate. Then we're going to get results from our model. We'll probably go back and tweak those models again, depending on the results or depending on maybe additional data coming in or thinking about new hypotheses driving uh, these distributions and patterns. And then we're going to look at our population level inference. So remember, our model is just a mathematical abstraction. Um, and we need to be sure we're thinking about the biology underlying that mathematical um, abstraction. So uh, there are, you know, obviously many different types of sampling approaches that can be incorporated into an occupancy model. So you have simple random sampling where your sampling units are drawn at random from an entire sampled population with equal probability. So this is great and all, and you know, one of the, one of the better ways to survey, but uh, logistically it can be really tricky if your uh, study area has a lot of habitat heterogeneity. Um, uh, if you are looking for a species that occurs in a specific type of habitat. And by random sampling, you're si surveying all these other types of habitat and missing the, <laughs> the specific um, habitat of, of inference for your species. Uh, so that's where the next level is stratified random sampling. So we want to think about how the population is divided into strata, which are then randomly sampled. And so those would be if you're dealing with a heterogeneous habitat and you have forest and wetlands and um, uh, agriculture, and you realize that deer actually use uh, all of those different habitats, but um, something like a muskrat really only uses the wetlands. You would stratify your samples differently depending on your target species or if your 
you know, uh, broadly interested in the whole carnivore community, you would stratify those in proportion to the habitats uh, that are occurring in your study area. Systematic sampling is where the units are sampled in a regular scheme and a random start is usually selected. So for example, in Key Largo, uh, we have a systematic grid of supplemental nest structures. We have a supplemental nest structure every 150 meters across the whole um, uh, Crocodile Lake National Wildlife Refuge. And so every year we can go out and look at that systematic grid and that gives us a, a wildlife refuge inference of where these uh, rodents are occurring um, uh, over time. And then uh, repeat or double sampling. So this is again um, a, a part of occupancy models um, where we are uh, overlap in sample units using two different methods or multiple surveys or multiple observers uh, over space or time. Um, and so what those look like visually we have A, we have that, um, you know, just a random point in our, uh, this is a tiger reserve uh, from Nepal. Uh, you know, we can sample that one point, but the reserve, we want to make our inference for the whole population. So making inferences for the whole population from that one point is, you know, a gross misuse of our data, right? So then we scale it up to a systematic approach. For example, in B, where we survey these four um, one kilometer, you know, 10 kilometer square grids, uh, or six 10 kilometer square grids, um, but we're still missing a whole portion of that protected area and our population of inference. So then um, C is where we really do a, a full scheme, a full scheme of a random sample across those across that park and you can see there's pretty good coverage, but maybe it's really hard to access all of those and it takes months to get those survey data. Um, or for example, uh, tigers use trails, right? So maybe the issue is that if there's not a trail in a block, it's really hard to find tiger tracks. Uh, D is an example of the stratified random sampling where you can see the numbers. We have four different habitat types and so we stratified the numbers of random samples from each of those four habitat types in proportion to their occurrence within our national park here. Uh, e is an example of kind of a little more systematic approach um, where, remember I said tigers use trails. So now we're surveying trails and you see that there is some uh, correlation between the <coughs> excuse me, uh, different grids that we're sampling. And so that's, um, you know, eases our ability to, uh, excuse me. Survey uh, a broad sweep of this park without in influencing the, you know, affecting the logistics of how easy it would be to survey uh, that study area if we're just walking along all these trails. And then finally, F is uh, that random sample again, but the black dots are the sites that are double sampled, for example. And so, um, so one of the things that we'll learn with occupancy models is we don't need repeated surveys from every single site. We just need them from uh, you know, a reasonable proportion of them to estimate detection probability. Yeah, I know it's fun, isn't it? Okay, <clears throat> so just a quick reminder, we need to identify our objective, uh, whether it's uh, figuring out how many tigers are in a national park in Nepal, or how many coyotes are harvested per year in, in the Midwestern US, uh, or how many wood rats or, or uh, beach mice occur in a, a dune coastal environment. Uh, or how effective some adaptive management is, like uh, removing pythons or removing feral cats uh, for the um, recovery of these endangered rodents. 
Uh, the field sampling must be designed to meet those study objectives, right? So if you are interested in the adaptive, man uh, you know, uh, qualif quantifying the effectiveness of the adaptive management of a uh, endangered rodent population, and you, um, you know, remove a whole bunch of pythons from a study area, but don't, but uh, survey it right away, you might not be capturing the, the response because it takes time for the rodents to rebound. So you need a lag period, for example, if you're going to effectively um, estimate uh, population recovery from some adaptive management plan, or the effects of fragmentation on a species community. You might not see the species blink out yet um, if they're, uh, um, you know, restricted to a fragmented forest uh, site. Um, the field sampling must be representative of the population of inference. You know, one thing that can can be quite frustrating is uh, when you're out and you you um, you know you detect all of these individuals, uh, a deer, for example. If you're using a net gun, it's very easy to capture deer with a net gun from the road. But if you're only capturing deer near the road, then where is your inference for the deer that avoid the roads because they are adversely associated with humans? And so your population of inference might be uh, just deer that are associating with people's gardens and yards, and uh, it might not be reflective of the whole deer population uh, in an area. And then incomplete detection must be accounted for in sampling and estimation. So remember, animals are elusive. They, in many cases, avoid us. Um, and it's incredible where they can hide and we'd never know that they're there. And they're not always leaving as much sign as you would think. So it's important to consider that absences are not are not always true absences and might reflect our inability to detect a species when it occurs in an area. And that's the whole reason occupancy modeling was, um, <clears throat> was created to model and account for that incomplete or imperfect detection. <clears throat> so again, um, we have to remember that our hypotheses, it, our hypothesis is a story about how something works or operates based on our observations, right? We hypothesize that uh, species A likes habitat B because we've started to collect some data. A theory is, that hypo is when the hypothesis is widely accepted after surviving repeated attempts to falsify it. Uh, you know, the mesopredator release hypothesis <clears throat> it's probably approaching that level where it should be considered a theory uh, because it's, you know, there's broad support that mesopredators expand in their ecological niche and their distribution and abundance in the absence of apex predators. And then remember, a model is an abstraction of our system, mathematical abstraction usually, and can be used to, pre to predict the system behavior <clears throat> by uh, including hypotheses and theories about that system. And so the models are really uh, each a hypothesis that we're testing to look at the effects of uh, habitat or humans or adaptive management on a species of uh, concern. Sorry. And remember, all models are wrong, but some can be useful. Right, so we can never use a mathematical model to account for everything biological happening um, <clears throat> in our system. And so, uh, so a good example would be um, there are all different types of covariates that you could measure about me uh, <clears throat> in a in a given morning, and you could say, okay, we measured uh, what what Mike's wearing, we measured the temperature outside, we measured the humidity outside, 
We measured uh, if he ate breakfast or not. We measured how many cups of coffee he had. We measured if he combed his hair, if he showered, et cetera. Um, uh, the day of the week. And you could try to make predictions about what I'm going to do, right? But really, the number one predictor that you could use is whether it's a weekday or a weekend, because uh, pre-COVID, on a weekday, you could predict with pretty good reliability that what I'm going to do that day is go to work. And on a weekend, uh, I'm going to hang out at home and do something else, um, right? And so what you can see is you can throw all of these different covariates into a model and try to make inferences, but really it's sometimes as simple as you know one or two covariates that really have the power to predict what's going on. And sometimes those are habitat or human associated um, and things like that. And so <clears throat> it's important to remember that com these competing hypotheses are represented as different models. And so, um, you know, everyone's done this, uh, just a quick reminder, simple linear regression, right? We have, uh, here's a, a, an example of a model where we have college entrance uh, tests. We're trying to predict college entrance test scores on high school GPA, right? And so um, we collect all this data from all these individual high school students and their uh, test scores. And, uh, and we model out their GPAs, and then we try to fit a line. And what is the equation of a line? Remember that it's y equals mx plus b, right? Where b is the intercept, the y-intercept. Oh, there we go. B is the y-intercept, and m is the slope or the effect of that covariate, and x is the covariate, right? And in this case, uh, in our, you know, uh, simple linear regression here, uh, in our model, you can see we have beta naught, which is the intercept. Here, it looks like it's about five, right, where the, where the uh, line crosses the y axis. And then we have all of our data points mapped out. And then we have beta one, which is the effect as you increase the high school GPA, you can predictably uh, estimate an increase of say, what is that? About four and a half to five points higher uh, for every increase in GPA, right? And uh, if you look at the lower equation, remember that we're, you know, you can see there's a lot of variation across these GPA points from our line. And so remember that we're also, at, we also have to estimate that error term, right? Because there is variance here where we can't predict anything with certainty with a line. So that was a general uh, linear model, right? But occupancy models are generalized linear models. So the difference is in that general linear model, our response was what uh, um, college entrance score, which ranges anywhere from probably zero to a hundred or or whatever the the units are. I don't I don't remember. But uh, for our occupancy data, remember what are our possible um, uh, data uh, attributes. There's only two, right? We can have presence or we can have absence. We can have one, the species is present, or we can have zero, the, the species is absent. But meanwhile, we still want to fit a line to those data. And so a generalized linear model, a GLM, is basically just uh, transforming those data to fit a line and then back transforming it to fit a probability to uh, predict where, the, where that, have, that covariate association and how it affects um, the probability of a species occurring at a site. So, and then you'll see that we just basically fit a curve at some point where you can see uh, in this figure, we have the probability um, y equals one, right? And some covariate on the x-axis. And you see that 
around a five on the covariate scale, we breach the 50% mark of the probability of use of a site given that covariate. <clears throat> And so, excuse me, there are all different types of GLMs, right? So the, the simple zero or one is, is called logistic regression. And really, if you're familiar with logistic regression, what we just discussed, it's an occupancy model is really just a, a fancy hierarchical version of a logistic regression. Uh, you have Poisson regression, where you're trying to um, model your data to counts. So, uh, so this is different than, for example, the linear regression, that, the simple linear regression that we showed. The scale doesn't matter. Whereas Poisson regression, we have counts. So uh, we have a restriction of what our data can fit. <clears throat> fit, right? So Poisson regression, uh, if you're familiar with n-mixture models, uh, n-mixture models are a hierarchical version of a Poisson regression, where we're modeling counts, where our, our counts can range from zero, no animals at a site, to, uh, you know, whatever, technically infinity animals at a site, but we can't have portions of animals. We can only have counts, so it's going to be full integers. So we have zero animals, we have one animal, we have two animals, but we can't have 2.5 animals. <clears throat> and so again, I, I just mentioned the occupancy model is gonna be this uh, hierarchical logistic regression. The N mixture model is gonna be this hierarchical Poisson regression. You have other things like beta regression um, that you might see and use sometimes, which the uh, effect, um, is constrained between zero and one. So this is where you would, what you would use to model something like um, proportion of time feeding or proportion of time vigilant uh, in a, a species of interest, something like that. Um, so model comparisons. So I think, you know, the first thing we all learn in our general biostats class or uh, you know our first stats 101 is thinking about hypothesis testing and hypothesis testing is driven by seeking sufficient evidence to falsify a null hypothesis right um, <clears throat> you know, white-tailed deer are associated with forest cover is our hypo is our uh, alternate hypothesis white-tailed deer are not associated with uh, forest cover is our null hypothesis. Now, <clears throat> if you're doing a controlled experiment, this can be an effective way of, you know, really robustly estimating effects of, uh, of your treatments. But in a lot of instances, for example, the statement I just made, white-tailed deer are associated with forest or they're not associated with forest, we already know <clears throat> that to some extent, they're associated with forest. Maybe they're also more associated with the cornfields at certain times of the year, or people's gardens at certain times of the year. But we know that for sure, the null hypothesis is in fact wrong um, already. And so the information theoretic approaches is a way for us to rank models <clears throat> in order of their relative distance from the quote truth, where we can see, um, where we can rank models and say, okay, uh, we are actually testing five models of deer habitat association, and we're comparing if they are associated with agriculture, compost piles, uh, waterways, forest cover, or um, I don't know. Uh, uh, where, where wolves are absent. And we could rank and compare those models and see which has the most um, useful inference for driving the pattern that we see 
in the distribution of the deer, <clears throat> of the white-tailed deer that we're modeling. And so we can, um, so we rank those based on their relative distance from the truth, which, and the truth is our best model. Um, and so if we're running all nonsensical models, it's not gonna make any sense. We, the, the thing about, the thing to remember about uh, a, um, information theory and, and competing models is that you need some a priori biological driver of this pattern that you're predicting. Otherwise, <coughs> you're not going to be able to make much inference um, because all of your models are, are inherently wrong, for example. Uh, if we you know, tried to predict the distribution <coughs> of uh, white-tailed deer uh, in the summer based on how fast an ice cream cone melts at, across our different sites, right? Um, that's probably a meaningful thing, but it's kind of a spurious correlated effect, right? Where it's the uh, air temperature at a site <coughs> and could be accounting for the shade, for example, or something like that. And so we can calculate model weights, which are the proportion of evidence for a given um, model. And we rank those with uh, Akaike information criterion. Um, and that is uh, a way to rank these models uh, and their relative distance from the truth. <coughs> So we call that AIC, right? And so AIC model selection is that relative information distance from the truth. So we have AIC, which is the Akaike uh, information criterion. And then we have the Delta AIC, which is the AIC of your uh, model minus uh, the minimum AIC. So the minimum AIC, the lowest AIC value is our top ranking model, the closest to the truth, as far as we can tell. And so as you <clears throat> get lose support for your models, you grow in the Delta AIC. And so usually, um, we, we usually say that models within say two to eight AIC, uh, Delta AICs from the top model are potentially useful competing models for uh, making inferences to our population. <clears throat> um, and so the models with this, the smallest AIC values are the most supported models. Now, again, this comes back to the idea of parsimony. Parsimony, remember my hypothetical model about predicting what, what Mike Cove is gonna do on a given day. We measured all these covariates about me. <clears throat> We can run a model with every single covariate and it will probably, you know, really effectively predict what I do. But again, the number one predictor was that day of the week <coughs> effect. And all of the other things add a tiny bit <coughs> of information, but not enough to be worth collecting all this additional data. So recently I actually find that um, instead of, you know, I, I used to feel like I should collect every single covariate possible for a study system and run dozens, if not, you know, uh, you know, several, several or dozens or 30 or 40 models to try to explain something and compete them. But more and more, I think the simpler it is, the more knowledge you have about your species and your system, the, the better you are to fit these a priori hypotheses. So lately, <clears throat> you know, I'll, I'll compare six models or eight models or something as opposed to 30 or 40 or what I really, really don't like, uh, and I'm sorry if I offend anyone that does this, is, you know, nowadays with R, there are packages, things called, like Dredge, for example, where you could just run every single possible model and you're running literally thousands of models. A, you run the risk of uh, encountering spurious effects, but B, you're not necessarily giving it enough thought. And, and the whole point of this process <clears throat> is to 
test our hypotheses and make predictions about our population of inference to inform ecology or conservation or management or some variation of those things. And so we should really have a very good idea about our, our study organism and read the, the relevant literature going into this that we already have our hypotheses and our ideas about what's driving these patterns and we can test just those. And then you can tease apart effects of, for example, removing uh, the effectiveness of removing pythons from the Florida Keys versus the effectiveness of removing feral cats versus the effectiveness of restoring nesting habitat. Then you have some level of <clears throat> confidence in saying, actually our model supports that the number one thing we need to do right now is address this Python issue. So let's focus all our efforts, our funds on that right now, because this is the most critical issue. We go back a year later, we've, we've put all our effort into um, you know, managing pythons. The next year, we should do the, the data collection again. We run the models again. Okay, wow, we manage the pythons. Now, uh, the models suggest that we need to get back on to the feral cat issue <clears throat> because uh, we removed so many pythons, the wood rats are rebounding, but the pythons were eating the feral cats, and now we have a feral cat issue. And so this is, this is classic adaptive management, right? That is the point of long-term monitoring of populations to inform conservation and ecology. And so we should be thinking about all of these possible hypotheses associated with our objectives and questions um, before we collect the data, before we start running the model. <clears throat> okay, so that's it for the uh, stats review.